Okay, welcome everyone um, to this session on decoding trade agreements, what happened on digital markets, uh, presented by the EduCloud Computing Association and Access. Uh, now, trade agreements have uh, uh, gone far beyond the original purpose of simply uh, regulating tariffs and, uh, and that sort of thing uh, in trade between countries. And now uh, they've expanded to include so many other issues, um, including the uh, free flow of information across borders. And uh, that's going to be one of the uh, one of the increasingly uh, most important uh, areas for digital rights activists, along with intellectual property, of course, as we look at trade agreements such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the Trade and Services Agreement, and so on. So uh, we're very um, lucky today to have uh, three excellent panelists with us to explain and explore these issues. So uh, I'm simply going to hand over to them to allow them to themselves. Um, so, uh, beginning from my right. Hi, my name is May Ann. I'm the Executive Director for the Asia Cloud Computing Association. And today I'm going to be talking about how the Asia Cloud Computing Association is advocating for the free flow of data across borders because we believe that trade, sorry, we believe that data is the lifeblood of the next, this new economy. And uh, so, therefore, any, um, any attempt to stem my that Flow, or any attempt to stem that particular flow is going to be a problem for the digital economy that's emerging everywhere. Good morning, I'm Joseph Kurudanan, and I work for an NGO called Focus on the Global South. It's a regional NGO, our headquarters is in Thailand, but we have an office in the Philippines and, and in uh, Delhi, in India, and we work in the Mekong region as well. I coordinate the Philippine office. Hi, good morning. My name is Edna Garcia. I'm focusing on this access. I'm based in the Brussels office and follow the trade negotiations at Access and we do a special focus on the TTIP, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, uh, TPP and the TISA agreement. And this morning I'm gonna focus on the impacts on digital rights, in particular data protection and neutrality, um, national security and credibility at each other. Very much. So uh, Joseph is going to begin uh, by giving us an overview of this issue. Thanks very much, Joseph. Thank you. Yeah, I will ask my staff to give an overview. I don't really work on digital rights, so my presentation would really to lay the landscape, if you may, of the trade agreements, particularly from the purview of someone working out from Asia. Let me begin by saying that uh, if you look at the global trade and investment regime that is now in place, it is already highly highly liberalized. The formation of the World Trade Organization, which will be celebrating 20 years this year, was formed in 1995, and the successive negotiations for bilateral and regional free trade agreements has established a world where there is already almost unfettered flow of trade. Tariff rates globally have considerably fallen, many falling within the zero to 5% range. So we're talking here, when we talk of trade, we're talking of trade in goods, but also trade in services. I think this is an important point to underscore at the beginning of this presentation as we examine the current trade and investment policy landscape. What dominates the landscape now are so-called mega regional trade agreements. Some of the acronyms have already been mentioned, TPP, let me add RCEP, and FTAAP. The TPP stands for the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, a high stakes, high standard agreement being negotiated by 12 countries, largely regarded as a US-led initiative. The agenda of the TPP talks revolve around an agenda which according to the US trade representative would make TPP unquote, the key elements are comprehensive market access, it aims to facilitate the development of production and supply chains, cross-cutting issues of regulatory coherence, competitiveness and business facilitation, small and medium enterprise development, and addressing new trade challenges related to the digital economy and green technologies. Another defining feature of TPP, and one that really stands out as a major innovation, and I, I use that in a negative sense, 
in the approach to trade negotiations is the idea of a living agreement, which will enable the updating of the agreement to address future issues as well as the expansion of the membership. The Philippines, for example, is not part of the 12 that are currently negotiating the TPP. Once the TPP is concluded, it will then be open for countries like the Philippines to join. And the Philippines has already uh, is already developing a roadmap to join the TPP. TTIP stands for the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the high-level talks between the United States and the European Union. RCEP is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement between ASEAN, that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and its development partners, China, Japan, Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, did I miss out anything? <laughs> you might have added something. And the last one is FTAAP. It's the newest proposal for a free trade area in the Asia Pacific, which is now an ongoing discussion under the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or ASEAN. Another important point to stress at the onset is that these negotiations are happening in almost total secrecy and devoid of people's participation. Another important issue, however, with, with, with respect to access to information, as I heard the word flow of information, free flow of information, is that while social movements, human rights networks, civil society groups are being kept out of the loop in these negotiations, Corporations have been given privileged access to these negotiations. In the TPP, there are around 600 or so corporations that are actively engaged. What we know about these negotiations, we get from news reports and from leaked documents. Thank you to those good souls who leaked those documents. In most instances, the people get to see the agreements only once the negotiations are finished. So nothing else to do but you know, raise your voice perhaps in Congress to try and prevent the ratification of these agreements. So what are these negotiations really about and whose interests are served by these agreements? The launch of the TTIP talks in 2013, now touted as the biggest trade deal in history, to me signified an intensification of a de facto third war among the trade superpowers, the United States, the European Union, and China all aggressively pushing their geopolitical, geoeconomic agenda within their respective regional platforms or networks of free trade agreements. The sizes and strengths of these economies under these mega trade deals are huge, therefore, the impacts would de definitely be global. To a large extent, these developments in the FTA front are also motivated one way or another by the desire to get a slice of the action right here in Asia. There's been a lot of talk about, about Obama's Asian pivot in the military sense, the shift in US foreign policy aimed at refocusing on Asia, and the underlying motive of counterbalancing China's power and influence in the region. On the economic front, we see the TPP and TTIP to a certain extent as part of the economic pivot to Asia. Asia is valued for its raw materials. Countries like Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, for example, are already starting to ease restrictions on foreign ownership and control of land, water, and natural resources. And there continues to be a mad scramble for control over these resources. As a result, we see increasing conflict over these resources, pitting communities against corporations, with governments, unfortunately, taking the side of transnational corporations to protect investments. We see rising human rights abuses, killing of activists, of indigenous leaders, human rights defenders, and criminalization of dissent. Asia is also eyed and targeted because of its large number of state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, that contribute anywhere between 15% of GDP in the case of Singapore and Malaysia, to as high as 30 to 38% in the cases of China and Vietnam, respectively. There is now an agenda to reform the governance and corporatize these SOEs. And finally, Asia is valued in the equation because of its growing market. Many of the countries in East and Southeast Asia continue to experience high growth from 3 to 6%. The same holds true for the e-commerce market, as I learned. Southeast Asian e-commerce market, for instance, is valued at around 22 billion US dollars and with potential to expand further. 
What are these talks really about? What is what are these talks? Who will who gets to set global rules is really what these talks are about. And so we must view these agreements as instruments to establish these rules and standards. The United States are, and Europe are pushing their own values and principles of rules-based market economy, of liberal democracy, as a way to counteract China's own trade agenda. The logic is that China's competitiveness rests on its monopoly control, quote unquote, of minerals, rare earth, its depressed economy, or the power of state-owned enterprises. And compelling China, therefore, to conform to the rules set by this transatlantic alliance would take China's aggressive agenda. China's perspective, on the other hand, is that it understands that this is the new normal and it understands the new dynamics and aims to be a leading part of it rather than being isolated from it. So in essence, what we are seeing is a clear jockeying for position as to who will define the rules that are critical to protecting competitiveness, but also ensuring long-term economic dominance. On the agenda, however, what we also must see at this point is really some sort of convergence among the major players around ambitious and contentious aspects of the agreement, as I will discuss in a way. Central to this convergence is the common view or narrative that is being pushed that we are now, what we now have is a 21st century trade and investment regime. This strong consensus is being pushed by institutions like the OECD, World Bank, IMF, the World Economic Forum, among others, including academics. The argument is that under a highly liberalized regime, the trade and investment challenges are far different from the challenges we've currently done. Whereas the emphasis before are to liberalize markets, to reduce tariffs, and later on, um, locking in trade policies under free trade agreements. The concerns now revolve around sustaining and deepening trade openness and fostering connectivity under global production chains and harmonization of rules. The World Bank has clearly spelled out the imperatives of this new global trade and investment regime. The first goal is to maintain existing level of openness, make sure that the protectionist tendencies that emerge after the global economic crisis are curbed, Second is to make sure that those who do not comply are punished. <laughs> Easy as that. So if you don't comply to the rules of open trade, then there must be a system or a mechanism in place to punish those who don't comply. What, is, what are the mechanisms? There's a, in the WTO, there's a dispute settlement body that acts like a court. And in many of the free trade agreements, there's a provision called investor to state dispute settlement that gives the, corporations the power to sue governments over policies that they think to be counter countering their objective of higher, 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 more and more and more profits. And, that, and last but not the least is that the aim for deep, uh, deep end cooperation in, to increase openness or deep FTAs. The most basic central to this 21st century trade regime are the new generation FTAs. And the most basic, basic thing to understand was underscored already is that these are not just about trade anymore. They encompass a whole range of economic policies that push for market liberalization of goods and services, stronger and more restrictive intellectual property rights, e-commerce, but also the easing of restriction on investments and greater investor protection. These agreements push for greater connectivity both in terms of infrastructure and technology. These agreements lock in economic policies to terms that serve the interests of transnational corporations and the global production network. So, and that global production network is, I, I think, an in central element as well of this in international regime, where everyone is viewed, where the borders are really have already been blurred among countries between countries, and what. All of us are viewed, well, the countries are viewed as part of a production chain. And therefore, it is in your interest to remove restrictions to your export because it contributes to the global production chain. So if you're Cambodia or Myanmar and your main production is raw materials, then by hell or high water, 
you have to extract those resources and very quickly export those resources out because you contribute to the global production chain. Who dominate the global production chain? Transnational corporations. PNCs have the capacity for ownership and control over all aspects of the integrated production network. So given the nature of these deep RTAs, deep FTAs, it's not surprising that the more contentious issues are not simply over market liberalization, but on the issues where the most aggressive agenda lies. And this is are in the intellectual property rights chapter, as well as in the investment chapter or the, the provision on investor protection and regulatory coherence. I leave this discussion on the implications on digital rights up to you, who are, I think, the experts in the field. Did, did, let me just say that digital rights are being touched upon in one way or another under different chapters being negotiated in these agreements. The chapter on intellectual property rights touches on the issue of copyrights and patents, where the agenda being pushed is how to establish higher standards of IPR protection. There's also an e-commerce chapter, at least in the leaked document from TPP that I saw, that is being discussed. I don't, I haven't seen the entire chapter, but I saw a matrix of chapters being discussed. So that's as far as I can go with it. And as well as in the investment chapter, which would have implication on digital rights. I just want to underscore a main point for the consideration of the, the experts here. It is clear from our analysis of this agreement is that the corporate agenda is the one that is driving the negotiation. The most controversial provision on investor to state dispute settlement, which affords corporations the right to sue government over public policies, is something that many view as a threat to sovereignty. In the TPP, an e commerce chapter is being negotiated. The negotiations under this chapter have zeroed in on a few controversial issues based on a leaked document around the free trade in digital products, software, secure codes, privacy obligation and information exchange, local server requirement and necessity tests, and the application of dispute settlement to the chapter. A number of concerns have been raised around the e-commerce chapter. Privacy concerns, for example, particularly over the US agenda to have free flow of information across borders and ban on local server requirements. Many fear that national laws and policies on privacy and offshore personal data, which are already in place to protect information, will be undermined by these provisions. These provisions are being pushed within these trade agreements under the guise or the name of free flow of information, which is ironic considering the lack of transparency and access to information that characterize these negotiations. So we have to really take note whose freedoms what information for whose benefit are being negotiated here? Will these provisions within these agreements promote rights of the general public? Or are they really meant to protect the interests of e-commerce e -commerce or cloud companies over people's rights and welfare? Let me conclude by saying that these are broad agreements. The main challenge is how to confront these agreements how to confront the increasing corporate and elite capture of economic policies under, underpinning these agreements. The main question is how we build up our own power to confront this corporate agenda. The stakes are high. Do we want the corporate agenda underpinning these agreements to dominate and rule our world? Or do we want to push this agenda back and regain control of our power to define our own destiny? Thank you very much, Joseph. That was a, a very, not only a very useful overview of the area, but also a very useful trenching criticism of the whole process. And I think uh, gives us a lot of room for debate. Uh, and uh, in fact, we may hear a different perspective from our next, next speaker on some of those issues. Um, and uh, so I'm going to pass the microphone over to, to, to May Ann Lim um, from the Asia Cloud, Cloud Computing um, Association, who's uh, going to address uh, the uh, workshop now. Well, that was certainly a very spirited uh, and forceful, passionate uh, critique of the whole entire situation. Um, really, what I wanted to talk about, I, I am a representative of those corporations whose agenda is apparently being pushed on the TPP. Could you ask me exactly, yeah, could you ask me exactly how many negotiations I've actually sat on? 
grand total of zero. I'm not quite sure how I'm actually pushing the agenda, right? Because I'm not sure how, how, my, how, my, how my company is actually pushing that particular agenda. Um, and I think that a lot of the negotiations as you yourself have, have said mm. are closed door and are ruled generally by the trade ministers, if I'm not wrong. I, I, I've attended exactly two um, Trans Pacific Partnership discussions and we were a part of uh, of all things, we weren't, we weren't even given, sorry, I was part of the civil society's pass that allowed us to go in and not even sit in on any of the sessions, but rather to have our little own uh, section where we were presenting our, our agenda. And if we were so kindly graced by some of the ministers who were part of the discussion, they might swing by and listen to our discussions. But we, we weren't definitely, at least at, not from my point of view, we weren't pushing a particular agenda. Um, but let me let me speak on what I really wanted to talk about, and that's what the Asia Club Computing Association um, focused focuses on when it comes to trade agreements in general. So I'm not, um, pardon me, I'm not going to focus specifically on the TPP um, more broadly on trade agreements. What do we, as the Asia Club Computing uh, Association, what do we focus on um, on allowing the free flow of trade and data to occur? What's been happening? Um, as Joseph has mentioned, is that there are quite a lot of protectionist uh, regimes which have come up. Um, a lot of very interesting uh, customer, consumer protection uh, legislation and regulations which have come up, such as personal data privacy protection laws, which have been established in Singapore, in uh, in Thailand. I think that there's a bill going on in Malaysia that's been going on, and that's actually been established as well. Australia, of course. So there are a lot of customer protection laws that have been going up, especially with the with, around the uh, topic of personal data protection. And that's one of the things, one of the many regulations which have come up that have stemmed or stemmed the tide of uh, trans border transfer of data. And about a year and a half ago, the about a year ago, the Asian Cloud Computing Association we commissioned a paper along with the Asia Pacific Carriers Coalition, which are of course the telcos. Um, so a whole bunch of us, meaning that companies like um, C, Microsoft, uh, um, HP now, Symantec, we banded together with the telcos, including AT&T, BT, Orange, um, and, and we came and Verizon, and came together to write a paper on cloud data flows. We focused on the fact that a lot of these regulations which are coming up right now were preventing business from happening. We're preventing customers, like customers of the big MNCs, uh, meaning small and medium enterprises, meaning local local companies. They prevented from actually moving into this uh, global trade flows because they weren't quite sure if they were going to be on the wrong side of the law. So we decided that you know we've got to write write this paper and tell and lobby the government government policy makers to tell them that look you've got all of these very good legislation going on this, this is all very strong very good for consumers however it's sort of killing the businesses your local business, business as well because in order for trade to happen you need to make it is well established for cross-border data transfers so we, we we pointed this out we took it on a nice little road show around the region to tell, to tell the government that and they were appreciative of it. Um, and obviously we asked, well, could you show us a copy of the TPP negotiations as well? But of course we didn't have any luck there because obviously that, those discussions are secret. However, they said they did say that they would take it into consideration. And I view this as the, the rhythms of what, um, what goes on in the trade negotiation or in any kind of advocacy situation where you, you do have to do your own bit to contribute to the to the discussion that's going on. And then uh, perhaps it's because I'm Singaporean, so I don't quite understand this idea of democracy since we don't really vote for people. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, 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 I think that this is really the role that a trade, a goes, a trade association like the AC, ACCA, that's what we do. And the the corollary to that is a lot of the governments were keen on, on seeing uh, what else we have to say about empowering the local communities. So we said, that, well, we, we think that number one, Asia is going to power the next global growth in 
you know, in the next 10 years. Um, and number two, 99.95% of enterprises in Southeast Asia are actually small and medium enterprises. So it's like, well, the, can you show us some statistics on which are the industries that are going to be taking off in terms of cloud computing? Are we are we supposed to be enabling certain types of uh, industries? So he said, well, you know what? Give us a moment. Let's uh, reconvene. And I'm proud to say that today I'm going to be launching at this particular session, I'm launching the Small and Medium Enterprises and Cloud Computing paper, which sits somewhere uh, on one of those three seats that I have uh, ACCA material on. It's a 14 stu country study on cloud computing and how it enables small and medium enterprises. It goes into every single one of these countries and also on a macro scale, it, it has another uh, cloud, uh, cloud computing and small and medium enterprises attractiveness index, which shows you where, which countries are a little bit more attractive if you're a small and medium enterprise. Uh, if, if they, if the government actually is enabling you, is, is the government giving you a good investment landscape? So if you if you would like a copy, please, or two or three, please help yourself with that. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is really what the ACC does. Um, I, I can't really speak for all the corporations. I'm quite sure that there are corporate capture in certain cases, but I, I can't, I definitely cannot speak. I think that's a very good point um, that we can't regard industry as being homogenous and you know, certainly different interests at play in the trade negotiations and uh, on some issues they're definitely at odds with each other. Um, so, so that might be something we can explore further in question time. Um, but now I'm going to turn to Estelle who's going to uh, give us uh, um, her views on the topic. Thank you. I'm going to be speaking to Melanie Martyr for Colorado Sustainability Debate. Thank you just to echo some of the points that has been made uh, up until this point. Um, a trend that we see in trade agreement is indeed, uh, it's past the, the last generation of trade agreement, which is solely focused on tariff, and the new generation goes way beyond, beyond. Trade is a positive thing, and we provide a lot of opportunities to individuals if it's done in the right way on both process and content. On the process side, of course, we're always advocating for transparency and an inclusive process with access to more text because so far the work of civil society and all stakeholders, including companies, is largely limited by the limited access to documents that we can actually comment on. So it's really difficult to actually know the content of the negotiation and actually be able to provide a good analysis of what um, what's been going. So we have to rely a lot on leaks, which is unfortunate. But situation we are right now, <laughs> even though we see uh, from the European perspective interesting developments since uh, the change in the European Commission with more transparency and an, an improvement on that side, but as trade is not only unilateral, but also bilateral and multilateral, we would like to see this development on a more global scale. And coming later on the part of content, um, I've said before that trade could be an opportunity, but what we need to make sure is that um, human rights standards are in place around the world and are affected by this negotiation. Meaning, of course, we can discuss on cross-border data flow, of course, we can discuss on telecoms and many, many issues that will provide benefits to users and to companies. But we need to make sure that standards for data protection, that standards for encryption, that's, that protects people, that standards for net neutrality, that ensures that everyone can enjoy a, an open and free internet remains in place. I mentioned that because it's often the case on the leaks we have access and on the negotiation we're being invited to listen to that there is um, there is a lot of discussion on what trade or oh, data protection is how can we include um, in the word data protectionism where states who have high protection for data protection are seen by uh, other are if they are trying to put the barrier to trade when what they are trying to do is solely protect right for people in region where human rights, where data protection is considered as a fundamental right, as is the case in Europe and actually in many countries around the world, even in Latin America and Asia, we see a lot of development and more and more countries adopting data protection framework. It's the case also in Africa recently, the African Union passed their convention on cyber security and data protection. So we see a big development of data protection regime being put in place and it's important to ensure that trade negotiation does not weaken the standards that are being that are being protected. Um, on the issue of net neutrality, it's something that never came up on trade agreement before. 
but we recently from the TIVA, the Trade and Services Agreement, which includes, uh, I think so far, 27 partners from the WTO, <coughs> one of these partners being the European Union, which then means that it, this agreement is pretty broad, and there are actually at the moment discussion also to include China into this trade, so might be one of the biggest trade agreement negotiated at the moment. We've seen that um, not within the telecommunication chapter, but within actually the e-commerce chapter, some provision were made in order to allow differentiation on services, uh, on, the, on the delivery of services over the internet, which could affect then the legislation that exists around the world in Chile, for instance, in the Netherlands, in Slovenia, in Canada, etc. Many countries are actually looking at this issue at the moment. So it's really, what's really important also with trade to understand it's both part of the context and the context here is both the negotiation of course often happen at the same time as legislation protecting human rights being discussed in a country and that affects a lot of the negotiation both on this legislation and on the trade. So we take the example of Europe, which is closest for me. The trade negotiation on the on the TTIP with the United States is being extremely complicated and extremely controversial because Europe is at the moment negotiating um, they have a new law on data protection, a legislation on net neutrality, and it just started the process of the review of the copyright framework. It's therefore very complicated to engage into trade negotiation discussing those matters when at EU level, within the old 28 country, we haven't agreed on our own standard. It's therefore really hard to enter into a negotiation with the US on a so-called harmonization of standard where on the first place, we don't have the same conception of data protection, we don't have the same understanding uh, of net neutrality because our markets are completely different. It's not the same number of actors, it's not the same number of consumer. And on the copyright issue, we have also a completely diverging view and it's extremely complicated already for 28 countries to even talk about copyright. So it's really complicated to even engage with the US, which has a very clear and defined view on this point. Um, to continue on this IP chapter, which was one of the major part of the discussion on the TPP, we also think that the IP chapter is often used also to to um, to, to enable the um, the national secu some national security provision. For instance, in the TPP, there were a very controversial uh, provision that was put forward that would require ISP to actually actively monitor the um, the content being uh, delivered by um, users in order to make sure that they are not doing any criminal activity or copyright infringement. That will actually not, not only that, that is being made in order to stop copyright infringement, but it will actually have a really chilling effect on people putting them under surveillance because it, it requires ISP to monitor the content and have an active inspection on what the user are actually doing. And to continue on this national security um, perspective, since the stolen re revelation, there is a big lack of trust between partners when negotiating with the US, and this actually needs to be addressed in order to have a clear and open and frank discussion with the US. That's something we're always mentioning in, in Europe when we're discussing. You know, if, if you want Europe to trust the US as a partner, we've been partner from the US for a long time, and we have similar views on many, many points, but we really need to address this issue of mass surveillance. We need to have remedy for non-US citizen in, in the US in order to be able to, to file a lawsuit to, when there is abuse of this, uh, this, of this program. We need a true reform of mass surveillance in order to stop it being the reform of surveillance globally, both by government and by company. And if we do not address this issue first, there will be still this problem of stress that can actually undermine all the trade agenda globally. And then we see within the text that there is actually a national security measures that are being pushed that undermine some of the measures that countries are trying to take in response to the stolen revelation because they realize they're being, they're vulnerable and not only the US government is paying on them but also their allies. So it's include also our own government. So we're trying to put measures not only to protect us from the NSA but also the GCHQ, the DGSS and all the, all the allies. So it's important to ensure that of course national security is always a matter of states but we don't, we don't have to push surveillance through the trade because we've seen the impact of surveillance, the impact that it has on fundamental rights. And the reform of surveillance needs to be addressed soon if, you, if we want the trade negotiation to succeed. And I think I will stop.
co-chairing the group that we've been. Thank you very much, Estelle. And um, I uh, realise that I neglected to introduce myself at the beginning. So um, my, <laughs> name, my name is Jeremy Nahum, and I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And um, one of the issues which I do deal with is uh, um, trade agreements and their impact um, on digital rights. So um, being the moderator, I have the privilege of uh, uh, asking the first question. I, I think at least I'm going to claim that privilege. Um, so I'm going to direct this to Mayan, and um, it's about where you would draw the line between legitimate uh, data protection regulations and what you may see as an illegitimate uh, infringement on uh, free trade. So um, I will start with the example, perhaps, of local hosting numbers. So if there is a country that has a law <coughs> that requires certain types of personal data to be stored within the country, on, on servers that are hosted there. The argument is that uh, that's, that may be necessary to protect that data from uh, interception, perhaps under um, foreign governments, uh, um, by foreign governments or even by other corporations on overseas networks. Um, so is that necessarily an illegitimate aim? Is there some, uh, is there no basis for that? Or your response to that? Absolutely. I think that that is up for debate. Where that line is drawn is up for debate, and I think that that's where I think governments and civil society and corporations need to work together to find out where that that zone is. Now, I have great sympathy for for the government legislators at this moment. A lot of them uh, were trained in international studies; they were trained as politicians, and for them to be making trade agreements around technology that often stretches the capacity of government officials just a shade too far. You're asking people who have been, you know, studying World War II, World War III in their, in their universities to suddenly talk about copyright issues, IP issues, and of course they're gonna drag it over to what they, they know because that's just human nature. Now, the ACCA, we just came back from, from India. We were in Bangalore a couple of weeks ago because we wanted to start this debate from, uh, from ground up. And we, we held a discussion with the industry to say, hey guys, you know, we want to hear from you what exactly are some issues which are faced in India when it comes to policy making, when it comes to decision making. So they said that, they, they identified exactly this, they said the policy, the government policy makers, they're making all of these very strange rules around data of residency and they are not quite, uh, they're not quite cognizant of the, of the impact that it will have on people like us and the people around it, meaning Indians themselves. So they said that the government needs a trusted partner, which should not be a, we should not be a corporation. It should be some sort of a think tank or a research institute <laughs> that can help advise on matters that have to do with um, technology or, or have at least a technical partner that they can, they can a trusted technical partner that's a neutral party that can advise on these issues. So to answer your question directly, I mean, where, where do we draw the line? I think that governments themselves need to decide where to draw the line. It is their job to do so. That, that's, that's the purpose of government, to actually govern. So how do they govern? I think that that goes into a wide myriad of, of, of uh, different types of government structures, Singapore, Philippines, different types of ways which that discussion needs to start. I think that the government needs to find a way to bridge that technical knowledge gap before they can actually really answer that question. So I think that that's where the line should be drawn. Um, it should be drawn. It should be drawn with consultation. Uh, where it will ultimately lie is a matter of debate for each different country to um, start the discussion. And just to add on your question, actually, well, Actually, yes, something is uh, key in a lot of the trade agreements yes. that we are being that are being discussed at the moment. And I think there is a difference to be made between forced data localization, which is the types of forced data localization that is being uh, proposed, for example, in Russia, Vietnam, and Nigeria, which every content, everything that goes through the internet needs to be stored locally. And um, data localization requirement for data protection purposes, which include only a limited portion of data that needs to be stored in order to ensure a high data protection um, standards. That means that requires to be for some time or at, in, located in a specific area. But this data 
that can be transferred under a variety of um, some requirement I'm, I'm doing that. So it's not, for example, with the EU example, sensitive data are supposed to be stored within the EU, but then we have agreement with a lot of variety of countries, including the is that under a specific process, uh, if some requirement are being met, this data can be transferred. So yes, the data is preferably stored in Europe to ensure a high standard of data protection, but this data can be export side, which is the first data localization which require everything to stay within the one place. Yeah, but that, that's exactly that's exactly the point, because um, if, if you look at the language that is coming out of uh, places like Vietnam, places like uh, Indonesia, yeah. if you're looking at the legislation that's coming out, they are so vague. Yeah. It is, it is, the language from Vietnam is all public services should have their data, stat, uh, data, data stored within Vietnam. We should not do that. And it's that broad. And I look at the language and I'm like, I don't really think that this person who wrote this language and it's the same with some of the legislation from India, which came out about a, a year, a year and a half, two, almost two years ago. Um, in India, when data residency, when this discussion around data residency came, so coming out in, in uh, Southeast Asia, the legislation from India said all email that is transmitted from one Indian to another Indian, that email has to remain in India. And just talking to people and say, okay, so what, when the email gets broken up the packets, it's gonna, all that data it has to remain in. So the, 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 writing, the writing is that, that I'm reading is, I don't think that government legislators really know what they're doing. So, I mean, if they need people like you and hopefully people like the ACCA to go basically go in and, you know, help them figure out exactly how to do it. So what the ACCA, what we're working on, in fact, right now, we just launched it about two weeks ago, we're working on a project called Data Classification Project. Um, it is a, a way in which we can classify certain types of data so that they can move over um, borders easily. So we've got we've, we've seen some of that type of classification be happening. Uh, financial data is classified. Um, national data, national secrets data, obviously classified. Uh, we've got uh, credit ratings, for example, a good a good example of how classified data can move within very strict parameters uh, of secrecy and encryption. How to move it over from over border to border. So we're working on the data classification exercise where we can say maybe this is one way to go. High governments, maybe this is something that you'd like to consider. And we're, we're trying to be um, helpful partners in, in that in that discussion. So um, I'm going to turn to the panel, uh, sorry, to the floor uh, in just one moment, but I'm also going to give uh, Joseph one more bite of the cherry since uh, the other panelists have, have spoken again. Um, so do you think, Joseph, that uh, there is any legitimate role for internet policy um, to be dealt with in trade agreements, or are trade agreements the wrong vehicle for this? Like I said, I, I'm not an expert in the field, but working for so many years on the on looking at trade agreements, oh, as you said, it has more from a simple uh, you know agreements to to regulate uh, tariffs and to a more all powerful instrument already. And there are discussions several years back to include uh, labor standards, environmental standards, and I think in this case. I agree with the, the, the discussion. There are certain technical um, expertise that are really far beyond the capacity of uh, or competency of trade negotiators. But in response to that earlier question, I think we have to look at the whole way by which trade negotiations have proceeded really in, again, in almost, uh, total secrecy and lack of public participation. So we have to address those concerns, whether you're discussing uh, issues with pertaining to fisheries, for example, or whether you're discussing uh, digital technology or e-commerce. We have to address those fundamental points, fundamental weaknesses in the way the, the policy in general is, is being formulated. And opening it up to really more participation of concern sectors, including those that have the technical expertise. So my, that's a long answer. <laughs> but I think because it's such a, it's a, it's a new field and, and, and now I see more dangers 
in including it in under the purview of trade agreements, especially since, as I said earlier in my presentation, it has already that the trade negotiation, trade policy has already been captured really by corporations. So if you want that aspect to be captured by corporations, then why the what the hell? Let's include everything. Thank you very much. So we have about 25 minutes for questions, and I thought I saw a couple of hands up. Um, so can we pass the microphone? Yes, well? Ben and Alistair are raring to go. <laughs> hey, my name is Ben. I'm from Google. Um, so given the process concerns with the actors at the table, the level of transparency, um, and the uh, yeah, specifically those two, those two interests. Um, I'd love to, I want to get really specific about the specific harms that we're most concerned about outcomes for the ICT sector specifically. I know Zealot for the free flow of information I think is great for people's rights and it can be great for helping small and medium businesses as well. Um, I'd like to hear if you have any specific examples of the tangible harms that, you, that folks who are watching trade on uh, this panel are most specifically um, concerned about uh, regarding human rights. We'll take it. We'll take two questions, and then the panel can respond to. Uh, the, the, the gentleman at the at the back first, and then we'll come to the. Maybe we'll take three questions. Yes. Thanks so much. Uh, my question is to Estelle. Um, you have raised um, a lot of roadblocks between the EU and, and the US. Um, does that mean that the EU is I just have a question. Um, I wonder. Could you uh, introduce yourself? Um, I'm Alberto Seven from Fox Foundation. Uh, I understand that most of the concerns of the civil society that you can have about foreign policy that uh, group have been to prevent uh, damaging or unintended damaging methods from the trade agreements and the trade agreements. But I wonder if, in addition to do some control damage, is there any uh, possibility? So I'm going to uh, give all the panelists to, uh, a chance in turn to respond to those questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so the first question on specific examples. Um, like I said, there is limited access to document, but only reasonably few documents that we have access to. We see uh, three specific threats on um, data protection with the opening of um, of data flows that, that would uh, require the EU level of data protection to increase. This net neutrality that would um, actually contribute the influence of the new FCC decision and the development of the government and neutrality in many areas, and on national security, that's the three key elements that we've seen. Maybe to be more um, specific on data protection, it's, um, it's part of the e-commerce chapter, and the question is really on the fact that um, even though there is a GATS exception that is usually included on all this trade agreement, which makes privacy an exception, and typically when the EU is involved in a negotiation, uh, human rights are excluded, meaning that uh, as data protection is a fundamental right there, fundamental right uh, data protection and should not be an adverse issue. But when, of course, you need to talk about data flows, then the, the limit is uh, unclear because we need, of course, to enable data flow that's and not something really on the table, but something that's happening at the moment and we should allow. But we need to make sure that these standards remain. And um, even though the text mentioned a GATS exception, then they also said that the um, member states should adopt the least burdensome measure in order to protect those rights, which actually prevents some states, like at the moment, the EU is trying to create this level of protection in order to assure a more uh, users to get fully in control of their uh, of their data to ensure that each time you provide your data you need explicit consent that you can control everything that happens with your data and who has access to it. Um, and these negotiations are extremely controversial. There is uh, been 
already almost four years of debate on that. And when we see in this negotiation um, text being pushed in order to ask the EU to adopt the, the level, the minimal level of protection, then of course that's something that is really concerning for us. Then we have all, we have assurance from both sides that the issue of data protection will not be addressed. But as we said, when you touch on data flow, it's really hard to not include um, to not include data protection and actually to do take the question from our very top here positive agenda. It's true that, as we said, we do not propose trades on the basis, so we have um, a lot of concern in order to resolve this concern in the example, for example, of the TTP, the TTIP, sorry, on data protection. What we are calling for instead of addressing this issue of trade agreement, which we believe data protection is not the forum, the trade agreement is not the forum to discuss data protection, we are actually asking for a broader, a broader for a review of the safe hardware agreement, which is actually in the review process also at the same time of the negotiation in order to address this issue because data needs to be transferred in a, in a secure way in order to ensure that users know what's happening with their data. That should not be made in a trade agreement because it's really difficult in, in, to reassess always trade agreement, but that should be addressed through the mechanisms that are existing and are at the moment have been identified as problematic, such as safe harbor. So there is positive discussion at the moment with the US on that side and the discussion should be strengthened on that point. So in terms of it's a positive agenda saying, yes, it's an issue, but take it out of trade and put it on the context where we are actually focusing on data protection, where we have data protection experts, and where we can make sure that the data uh, are actually going to be protected. Um, on your question, did I miss anything? Oh yeah, the set um, I think it really depends on which tra trade agreement we're talking about. Um, at the moment, I would say, from a US perspective, uh, that the, TP the TPP is the most controversial and discussed agreement. In Europe, it's definitely the TTIP. While at the same time, the TTIP agreement is the biggest one, but the on most unnoticed one, at the <laughs> also. So I wouldn't say that Europe is a barrier because um, the European Union is really committed to, to find an agreement with all these countries. But it's true that there is, at the moment, a lot of discussion on TTIP because it's such a broad agreement and it's the first time that the EU is negotiating such a broad agreement that includes so many, many sectors and many interests um, at heart, which creates um, a lot of debate. Um, at the same time, I think the debate will also start in the US. Now we know that the negotiator have a very ambitious agenda and they would like to conclude this negotiation probably by the end of this year, but we have to also acknowledge that in June it's only going to be the second anniversary of the, of the launch of the negotiation. For such a massive trade agreement, it's actually not that much. And if this trade agreement is going to happen, it's going to have massive implication not only for the two parties, but also for the rest of the world, because they plan to set a high standard for the trade agreement in, in that area. So there is, um, it's important to take time in order to make sure that unprecedented content is good and it's not harmful for human rights and all the standards are being respected on both sides because there is also proposals from the EU that could actually undermine consumer rights in the US. So there is a lot, a lot of discussion uh, to be having and um, I know the EU government is pushing the agenda when the EU, uh, most of many EU stakeholders are also trying to stop the agenda. So there is a lot of criticism to this trade agreement but there is also a high commitment from the EU to deliver. Joseph, do you want to? Yeah, I would like to answer the question about, I, I take it as you meant uh, broader human rights uh, threats, right? Not just exclusive to those pertaining to data protection. In the intellectual property rights chapter, for example, uh, there's a concern that it could have a negative impact on people's access to medicine and right to health. There's a, one of the agenda that is being pushed by the United States and the European Union is this agenda for data exclusivity in uh, establishing a data exclusivity regime in the intellectual property rights chapter. Data exclusivity links the issue of patents to commercialization of medicines. It, it protects the original patent holder, the data of, that is um, 
held by the original patent holder from uh, being made public for the use of generic medicines manufacturer for a period of anywhere from seven to ten years, effectively extending the patent. So if, even if, let's say, I'm a patent holder, the patent on a particular medicine has already expired, if you have a data exclusivity regime, you have another seven to ten years where your data is remains your sole uh, property. And therefore, genetic medicine manufacturers, if they want to produce the same medicine, would have to either go through the same process, clinical trials, etc., before actually um, their, their uh, versions of those medicines will be made commercially available. So many public health advocates access to medicine, particularly HIV AIDS patients networks across Asia, are campaigning against this data exclusivity in the intellectual property rights regime, uh, intellectual property rights chapter of the agreements. This is in the TPP, this is in the EU free trade agreements with, that are being negotiated in Asia as well. So that is a clear case, I think, where uh, there's a provision that would clearly undermine the public health and access to medicine. The United Nations Development Program and UNAIDS have already said in a report that free trade agreements with this data exclusivity with TRIPS plus provisions are a threat to public health and access to medicine. In the case of the Philippines, I mentioned that we are trying to, the government wants to join the TPP, but even before us actually being part of the negotiations already, some of our laws are already being tampered with in a way. We have a, a cheaper medicines law that is in place in the Philippines, but we've got again leaked documents showing that within government, there have been discussions between the uh, Department of Health, the Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, where they are already trying to define amendments, proposed amendments to the cheaper medicines law to put in place a data exclusivity regime. And in their discussions, we found out that this, this is really driven by the TPP negotiations. So, sorry, they are looking at the time. No, it's, it's fine. Uh, we we're just checking the time. Um, but uh, thank you for that. And uh, Maya, do you have? No, I don't. I don't. I, I do. I do agree with. with uh, sorry, I don't. I don't really have anything to add. I do agree with uh, what uh, Asal and uh, Joseph have both said about that. And I'm. I'm definitely not advocating for human rights in any in any form or fashion in, in this fight. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Yes, another uh, follow up. Sure. Just uh, wait to the microphone comes. Joseph, Estelle, uh, talked a couple of times about the lack of transparency in these agreements. Is it that there is less transparency in these agreements uh, compared to previous trade agreements, or is it that it's perhaps intimated that the new trade agreements are now containing um, subject matter that was formerly uh, the exclusive domain of national jurisdictions and therefore would be expected? under those agreements. And can you also give your name and uh, where you're from? Oh, sorry, yeah. My name is Alice D. Grant. Um, I have my own independent um, telecoms IT consultancy. Um, I'm also an academic and chair um, neutral policy bodies. Thank you. Yes, this is actually a very good question. Um, the lack of transparency we refer to um, is especially on the fact that trade agreement, um, in the case, again, of the EU, um, when in place, overrule uh, what we call the secondary law of the EU, meaning all the legislation that are being developed in the EU. The EU treaties are above, it's a trade, and it's a trade agreement, and it's the legislation developed by the EU. So when we talk about this lack of transparency, it's in comparison to the legislation being developed in the EU, which the process is full of process, needs always to be improved, but all the time there is an impact assessment, a consultation process, publication of the draft, comments from stakeholder, publication of arguments, comments from stakeholder, etc. It's a whole transparent and inclusive process that we would like to see repeated on the trade agreement because it will have such a big impact on actually all our legislation. And we feel like people have the right to know what's going to be the rules that are 
I mean, it should be in place in all this legislation on all sides of the agreement, not only for one side. It should be also if if the EU citizen gets access to those documents, the US citizen and the US civil society and the US companies and all the stakeholders should have the same access to the document. We understand that it's of course complicated in a matter of bilateral discussion because of course you don't want to reveal all your cards. But this is really rules that are going to govern um, the people, the companies in the future. Therefore, we should have a right to know what's coming up. For First, for companies to know what's coming up in order to prepare, and also for citizens to make sure that these rules are not going to affect the legislation in place at the moment and the interests they've been uh, fighting for are going to be protected. Thanks very quickly. I think lack of transparency and lack of public participation applies to all trade agreements, even but uh, there are different uh, differentiated level perhaps, levels, perhaps. For example, the WTO has a website. Some of the documents are published in the WTO. But in the case of the bilateral agreements, you don't really have access to the actual documents until, like I said, they are the negotiations are done, and then you, you go to bilaterals.org and it's published there. So it's a it's a long it's it's been a it's an issue raised by civil society for many years. But now it's been, it's gotten so much attention because precisely the big players are now negotiating. And so all the attention are, I mean, when US senators complain against the, the TPP negotiations going underground, it gets picked up and all of this, attention. Okay, what's happening? But it's been a struggle for us, especially in Asia, to ask for information about these agreements and to ask for a seat, not maybe in the negotiating table, but at least to be seriously consulted and our views heard and considered. And as Estelle mentioned, the whole process of uh, trying to define a national negotiating framework, trying to conduct national impact studies, you know, the whole process has to be complied with. That what, what is happening right now is that the negotiators are really, you know, maybe being influenced by some corporations, not all, but some corporations are really defining the text of these agreements and pushing the agenda forward without public consultation. I think that the issues around transparency for the TPP were particularly, um, are particularly exacerbated because of the level of access that a lot of people now are used to uh, getting when it comes to anything in general. Um, the TPP has been particularly thorny because firstly, um, just to give a very easy example, there is no website for the TPP. You can find on your own government's website, and that then there lies the rub, right? Because if you're if you're used to your government giving you the information and you're saying, hey, hold on, the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore doesn't give me any information, I can't get any information. But Philippines, they I've got the text there, and they've got the announcements there, and in the US they've got, it. and then you start to wonder, hey, hold on, what's my government hiding from me? And so that paranoia just sort of creep in. Uh, so you, you the, the TPP is a is a, a little bit of a victim of uh, globalization and the desire for for access. Uh, I, I think that I, I'm very 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 worried that the TPP will be not successful, and then the government will turn around and say it's because we released too much information. Therefore, there was too much negotiation, even though nothing has actually been negotiated. Negotiated. Uh, and therefore, you know, it was too noisy, and then use it for legitimizing for legitimizing other discussion that will continue to remain even more stupid. And they'll say, "Well, you remember the TPP completely failed because you know we told you to do that. We, we told you to do things." So that's my fear. However, I, I am I am fairly hopeful that you know future other other agreements and the TPP might be uh, continue to be consultative and continue to open up negotiations for. Uh, in the space for you know, civil society and for you know, industry groups like us to, to participate. Um, there are a lot of competing other uh, regulations, sorry, not regulations, there are the competing agreements that are on the table right now. Uh, I am personally a big fan of the Asia Economic Community, so the fact that it's supposed to be coming to effect right now is uh, something which I think is helping to push that discussion along and helping to push the TPP to say, hey, besides the RCEP, of course, which is a US versus China race. We could actually hold an entire workshop just on the question of TPP transparency um, <laughs> alone. 
Um, but I think it's a very good point that's being raised that whatever transparency we do have, which is very little, um, is actually at the national level. So each government has a certain amount of communication that it does and it consults with certain of its own stakeholders. So a lot of the controversy about business interests having unfair access to the text is because the US government has uh, a set of uh, committees where industry representatives sit and they do have privileged access to the text in those committees. But that's not something that's been established for the TPP as a whole. And uh, so I, I wonder, just to follow on from the previous uh, discussion, if any of the panelists think that there is scope for us rebuilding the framework for negotiating trade agreements in a way that is more globally appropriate um, and, and isn't based on this piecemeal sort of nation by nation uh, transparency. What, what do you think? Thank you. And before addressing your question, just to make you a comment that may have been actually, I'm sorry, to con completely contrary. I think if TPP was to fail, that would be actually a big lack of transparency, not because it was too open. Uh, I think that actually transparency and the trust, again, that position that I mentioned before, the transparency and surveillance is addressed. If we have, if we address the mass surveillance problem, if we have transparent negotiation, then we have both trust and legitimacy in the process of the negotiation, and that would actually help. Um, and people, that's an argument where the lawmakers are, are now understanding uh, in Europe and in the US and many ne negotiations. It's like people do not trust what we are doing because we're not saying what we are doing. So, of course, there is many misconceptions that from, from the moment that arise because. Everything needs to be kept secret, and each time someone asks a question, it's like, just trust me, I'm doing the right thing. Well, of course, when you ask, when you tell people, when governments tell people, just trust me, I'm doing the right thing, it's like, I would like to believe you, <laughs> can you please turn the text? I do think we that, <laughs> I do think that transparency and trust are key to ensure the legitimacy of this process. And then to touch on your point, and actually it uh, continues on uh, what Alberto was asking of the political agenda, I think there is example of best practices in negotiation that exist and could be adopted on trade negotiation. So for example, uh, the example of the Harris Convention negotiation and another from the WIPO Treaty for uh, access to culture for blind people, which the process was extremely inclusive and all the documents were available online for comments for governments. Each time a new draft was coming up, it was also available for comments in order for everyone to see the process of the negotiation and the kind of being had it. And, uh, this process has been uh, broadly um, welcomed by the people and makes the process makes the agreement very legitimate because everyone, in the end, of course, it's always a consensus and it's, it's balancing the interests of all the parties. But all the parties really see where everything is coming, everyone is able to trace back and it brings legitimacy, which is really key on this trade. Mm -hmm. I agree that there has to be, uh, because when we, for example, when we engage the European Union, they will say that, uh, and calling for transparency in the negotiations, they will say, talk to your government. We are transparent as far as the EU is concerned to our own constituency or civil society. Of course, if you talk to European groups, they will say not true. <laughs> and there's a certain level of uh, uh, transparency that is there, but of course, whether or not the, the the inputs from civil society or social movements actually influence policy is another matter altogether. So they, they always direct us to talk to your governments. And when we do, they, as you said, there are different levels. So the, the Philippine government now might be open, but you know, in one or two years' time, there'll be a change of government. So, so there is a value, I think, to set, setting some, some sort of uh, global or regional maybe access to information standard, freedom of information standard. We don't have a freedom of information act in the Philippines yet. And we have been calling for a, at least an ASEAN-wide freedom of information policy, which, which I think would be good. But I also, but I hesitate because to push for a global standard, because precisely the problem with these negotiations is that matters relating to community interests, livelihood concerns of farmers or fisher folks, are taken up at a certain level of discussions and negotiations that are really far removed from the realities that are happening on the ground. So I think part of it has also to do with bringing down the negotiations to 
the level of community, to the level of people, so that the realities are really uh, factored in to these negotiations. So I, I, I don't know if it's a, it's a response to your question, but that's how I feel at the moment, given the, the situations that we are facing. And any closing remarks? I think that the idea of a framework for best practices when it comes to trade negotiations is a great idea. I just worry that, again, I have great sympathy with government legislators in this respect. Finding that sweet spot between enough consultation and too much consultation is a real challenge. For those of you who have visited Japan, if you've ever gone to Narita Airport, if you, the next time you fly into Narita Airport, you'll see that there is no patch of ground in the middle of Narita Airport. And that is because the farmers in Japan have said that that is a patch for growing rice. And because the lobby groups are so strong, there is that patch of grass in the middle of the airport that uh, won't ever be taken away by the government to build a, a you know, continue to build the, the airport. But it's a very, very small, ridiculous patch of stuff. And I think that that for me is the emblem of like, that's too much consultation. Um, I, I, I hope that there will there will be an ASEAN and Asia wide kind of framework for negotiation and, and, and discussion. Uh, and I think that if that's something that could be put as an outcome for something like this, for, for a rights contract, maybe that, that's the next thing that we should be looking at. Sounds like a very good uh, proposal. So uh, let's close on that uh, hopeful note. And uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.